Hello, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to Weekly Meditations on the Book of Revelation. This is week two. Let's enter into this time in which we receive the great hope that is offered here in this amazing book by allowing ourselves to rest, to breathe, and ask God's Spirit to be with us as we allow ourselves to just be with God. And so I invite you to repeat after me. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. And now a reading from Revelation chapter 2. Write this to Ephesus, to the, to the angel of the church, the one with seven stars in his right fist grip, striding through the golden seven light circle speaks. I see what you've done, your hard, hard work, your refusal to quit. I know you can't stomach evil, that you weed out apostolic pretenders. I know your persistence, your courage in my cause, that you never wear out. But you walked away from your first love. Why? What's going on with you? Anyway, do you have any idea how far you've fallen? A Lucifer fall. Turn back. Recover your dear early love. No time to waste, for I am well on my way to removing your light from the golden circle. You do have this to your credit. You hate the Nicolation business. I hate it too. Are your ears awake? Listen. Listen to the wind words, the spirit blowing through the churches. I'm about to call each conqueror to dinner. I'm spreading a banquet of tree of life fruit a supper plucked from God's orchard. Write this to Smyrna, to the angel of the church, the beginning and ending, the first and final one, the one dead and then come alive speaks. I can see your pain and poverty, constant pain, dire poverty, but I also see your wealth. And I hear the lie and the claims of those who pretend to be good Jews, who in fact belong to Satan's crowd. Fear nothing in the things you're about to suffer, but stay on guard. Fear nothing. The devil's about to throw you in jail for a time of testing. Ten days. It won't last forever. Don't quit, even if it costs you your life. Stay there believing. I have a life crown sized ready for you. Are your ears awake? Listen. Listen to the wind words, the spirit blowing through the churches. Christ conquerors are safe from devil death. The word of the Lord. Well, now we're getting right into it. We began last week by taking a look at the first chapter of, of Revelation. And now here in chapter two, uh, we are hearing the letters that are being addressed um, by John, the seer to these various churches. And, and so now becomes the time that to, we need to just unpack a couple things. Now, I already told you that our goal in this journey is to engage in Revelation, understanding it as a poetic book full of images and metaphors that speak of hope, of good news in a situation where there was not a whole lot of hope. Yes, it is a book that is filled with all kinds of symbolism, symbolism that comes through the numbers that are 
that are listed um, um, symbolism that comes through the various elements. But um, but we are we get lost if we allow ourselves to to work through Revelation as if it's some sort of code book to crack. In in reality, all of the images, the metaphors, the numbers, they have their roots in the Old Testament. It's really no mystery. Um, but uh, in chapter after chapter after chapter, verse after verse, references are being made to imagery that is found in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament. But the way that it's put together gives it that fresh element of life that is grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So one of the first things we need to recognize is this number seven, the fact that it is seven lampstands. Uh, that gets lifted up in the image uh, uh, from chapter one. Um, seven lampstands are lit, which are the seven churches that are being addressed in these letters, uh, two of those churches being addressed in what I read to you today. Well, the number seven means complete. It is complete. It, um, creation uh, took uh, uh, six days to create, and on the seventh day, uh, God rested. That is complete. And, and that image of, of seven um, being a symbolic of a completeness um, is found often in the Old Testament and is used even in the Gospels. And so right away as listeners, when we hear that there being seven lampstands and seven churches being addressed, we don't want to allow ourselves to get bogged down on, on the specifics of, of Ephesus's problem or Smyrna's problem. Uh, in fact, what we have here is that this is a gospel that is universal, that is complete, that is for everyone. And uh, in these letters, two of them, like I said, we just listened to, um, we are getting a, a picture of the issues that they're facing, um, honestly given, you know, that they are struggling, but, but also a message of hope. One, the hope is found in the fact that Jesus is still with them. He dwells among the lampstands. The lights are still lit. So even though they may be suffering and wondering what kind of future they have, their lamps are lit and Jesus is there. There is an angel or spirit um, that is present you know, among them. And from that reality, they are able to draw. Um, so that that is a very important thing, and, and I just love. I mean, just look at how how uh, the letters are addressed. Uh, the one with seven stars in his right fist grip, standing through the golden light, seven light circle speaks, or or in the Smyrna letter, the um, the beginning and the ending, the first and final one, the once dead and then come alive speaks. Well, who is that? Again, those are poetic images. That, that come to us from the Hebrew scriptures of the Messiah of, of Jesus Christ. It could just say from Jesus, the resurrected one, or Jesus the Lord. But again, the poetry uh, is lifted up in this way, and, and, and it happens in all seven of the letters. Jesus loves them and is with them and is, is paying attention to them and wants to help. And so sometimes a lot is made about um, when we look at these seven letters and the seven churches, even coming to an understanding that it speaks to a, a universal and timeless problem that communities of, of followers of Jesus may be facing. Sometimes um, a lot is done to think about, well, what, what's, what, what, which church are we like? So, so is what's going on in Ephesus, does that speak to um, Christians in the United States today, or does that speak to Lutherans, or does that speak specifically to our Savior's Lutheran Church in Beloit, Wisconsin? Um, you know, you know, maybe, <laughs> you know, and it may be that something that gets lifted up in one letter does seem to touch it and, and hit uh, an issue that we're facing a little bit more than in the others. But, but, but nonetheless, that's not the point, not to find ourselves in Thyatira or Pergamum or Smyrna, but to recognize that in the universal whole of the church, the church today, the church of all time, there have been these struggles. There have been these problems. 
Um, so in Ephesus, there was a case where where they were um, had all kinds of energy and excitement. They wanted to follow the way and they were dedicated to it. Um, but they had lost their first love. And why? It's a kind of a common human trait that uh, the excitement we had at one point um, kind of fades a bit and we're not as excited about something. That is being described here um, in, in the letter to, to Ephesus. It speaks a lot like Jesus' parable of the sowing of the seeds, um, the seed that gets uh, placed among the thorns. Um, it does well for, for a while, but then is, is choked <laughs> uh, by the world and the worries of the world. Um, you know, so it, it speaks to that kind of a situation um, in which you need to be aware that there is a problem and be honest about the problem, but I'm with you. You can find that first love. And those who do, those who do turn back and recover their dear early love, um, you know, we are blessed. They are conquerors. And of course, um, you know, you are blessed because I'm spreading a banquet of the tree of life fruit, a supper plucked from God's orchard. Does that not sound like Psalm 23? Again, an image that is used here in Revelation. And so what we're going to see in these letters is, is again, not, not a message of, of red alert warning, you guys are doomed, but a reassuring, powerful message that tells you and them and us this, that God is with us in Jesus Christ, that our light is indeed lit, even though we face problems, that God through Christ is looking to encourage us and has given us a spirit that will give us the ability to persevere. And when we do, when we allow ourselves to be alive in Christ, to turn back, to, to follow faithfully, oh, how blessed we are. God cannot wait to lay out that uh, banquet that beautiful banquet on the green lush meadows so that we might enjoy and have abundant life. God cannot wait to place upon our head the crown that he, the life crown that's been sized and is ready for us. This is God's desire and it is the reason for Jesus. And here in the beginning of Revelation, that kind of encouragement to honestly look at your struggles, to look at where you may have gone off course and the hope and reassurance that you can get back on course. You can indeed follow the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. And now let us pray. Power of the Eternal Father, Help me. Wisdom of the Son, enlighten the eye of my understanding. Tender mercy of the Holy Spirit, unite my heart to yourself. Eternal God, restore health to the sick and life to the dead. Give us a voice, your own voice, to cry out to you for mercy for the world. You, light, give us light. You, wisdom, give us wisdom. You, supreme strength, strengthen us. Amen. So be at peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.